Kubernetes is a platform that can be extended, and that is because Kubernetes provides many interfaces for you to build a platform on top, whether it's for CI, CD, a serverless platform, monitoring, or security services. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at one of those interfaces, which is a webhook, also known as admission controllers. This will give you the foundational knowledge on how these things work and how to build your own. And then you can extend this knowledge to make Kubernetes do what you need it to do. What are admission webhooks? In Kubernetes, when events happen, like when you create a pod, delete a pod, scale a deployment, create a secret or an RBAC rule, these events or requests are generally invoked through the API server. Admission webhooks allow us to intercept these requests at different stages. We could intercept the request before it hits the API server and inject changes. Or we can intercept the request after it's been validated by the API server and either accept or reject it. Now there are two types of admission webhooks. One is the mutating webhook and a validation webhook. A mutating webhook is one that intercepts the object or the YAML before it hits the API server and allows us to make changes to that object. So a couple of use cases. One, we can inject default requests and CPU limits into a pod when it gets created, or we can inject some labels, or we can decide where the pod should go by injecting a node selector. The possibilities are endless. With a validation webhook, we can either accept or reject the request. A use case for this can be policy enforcement. For example, if a pod gets created without CPU and memory request limits, we can deny its creation. Or we can scan the pod specs and look at the image URL and only allow a pod to get created if it belongs to our registry. Or you could build a notification system that notifies you of events in your Kubernetes cluster. So the Kubernetes documentation is great at explaining what admission controllers are. And here they talk about validating admission and mutating admission webhooks. Now, the problem that I had that there wasn't much information out there on writing a webhook from scratch. In today's video, we're gonna be breaking it down. I'm gonna show you how to create a small Go development environment. Then we're gonna be deploying a Kubernetes cluster. We're gonna add the Kubernetes library to our code and write some code that talks to the Kubernetes cluster. And then I'm gonna show you how to use that code to create a small webhook that does a simple mutation. We've got a lot to cover today, so without further ado, Let's go. Now, if we take a look at our Git repo, I have a Kubernetes folder. And in the Kubernetes folder, I have an admission controllers folder. And in here, I have a readme. And this is the introduction to admission controllers with all the steps that I'm gonna be showing you guys today. So be sure to check out the link down below to the source code so you can follow along. Now, the first thing we're going to need is a Kubernetes cluster. Now, for this, I like to use a utility called Kind, which allows me to create a Kubernetes cluster in a lightweight Docker container that I can use for testing. So to create a Kind cluster, I'm going to say Kind Create Cluster, and I'm going to call it Webhook, and I'm going to run Kubernetes 1.20. So if I run this, this will create a Kubernetes cluster in a Docker container I can use for testing. So once this is finished, we now have a Kubernetes cluster. I can do kubectl get nodes, and you can see we have a one node Kubernetes cluster ready to go. Now the next thing we're going to need is a TLS certificate for the webhook. In order for our webhook to be invoked by Kubernetes, we're going to need a TLS certificate as it only supports TLS connectivity. Now in this demo, I'll be using a Cloudflare SSL utility for generating a self-signed cert. This utility is on GitHub. It's the Cloudflare TLS toolkit, which is a Swiss army knife for dealing with TLS certificates. I've documented the entire process over here. So we're going to use a small Debian container to install the SSL utilities and generate a TLS certificate. So the first thing I'm going to do is change directory to the Kubernetes admission controllers introduction folder. And then I'm going to run a Debian container. I'm going to say docker run minus IT, remove the container. When I'm done, I'm going to mount my working folder. I'm going to mount my working directory into a folder called work. I'm going to set that as the working directory and I'm just going to run Debian and I'm going to create a bash terminal. So if I copy this, paste it in the terminal, we're now in a container and I can do ls and we can see our 
code on the left here has been mounted into the container. So to install this Cloudflare SSL utility, I'm going to say app get update and app get install curl. And I'm going to use curl to download two utilities from the Cloudflare website. The first one is the Cloudflare SSL utility. And the second one is the Cloudflare SSL JSON utility. I'm going to download those, give them chmod execution rights and move them to user local bin. So I copy that. That'll go ahead and download the tools for us. And now that that's done, we can go ahead and generate our CA. So the first thing we need is a CA. And what I have on the left here in the TLS folder is I have a CA file. And this defines what my CA will look like. And then I also have a CA config, which defines my expiry for my certificate and my default profile. So to generate my CA certificate, I'm going to run CFSSL, gen cert, and I'm going to run init CA. And then I'm going to pass in my CA configuration file, and I'm going to pipe the result to the Cloudflare SSL JSON utility, which is basically going to take that output and split it into separate files under the temp folder. So if I copy this and I paste it to the terminal, that'll generate my CA certificate. I can do LS in that temp folder and we can see we have the CA key, we have the cert and the CSR file. So now I can use my CA to sign my certificates. So to do that, I can generate a certificate by saying Cloudflare SSL gen cert. I can pass in my CA values and my CA configuration file and I can pass in the pr default profile. And this is the important part. This is the host name I want to generate the certificate for. And the important bit inside here is going to be the fully qualified domain name of my webhook in Kubernetes. So it's going to be the name of the service dot the name of the namespace dot service dot cluster dot local. So I'm going to copy this block paste it to the terminal and that'll generate a certificate inside the temp folder called example webhook. So we generate that certificate. And if we do Alice in the temp folder, now we can see we now have our CA and we have our example webhook certificate. Now that we have the TLS certs, we're going to generate a Kubernetes secrets using those certs. So I'm just using cat here and I'm creating a YAML file out of the certificates. So I'm creating a YAML file for a Kubernetes secret and I have two files embedded into the secret. The tls.cert and the private key. And generally when you create Kubernetes secrets, you have to create a base64 of that file. So what I'm going to do is create base64 values of each of these files. So to do that, I run cat and you can see here I'm taking my certificate, piping it to base64 and moving any new line characters. If I paste that, we can see we have our base64 of our certificate and I do the same for the private key. So I'm going to copy this cat statement and I'm going to paste it to the terminal and that's going to create a YAML file file on the left here. If I click into that, we can see we have a Kubernetes secret now with a TLS cert and key. The next part is to configure the webhook with the CA. In order for Kubernetes API to make a successful TLS connection, it needs to validate our certificate. So it needs to know the CA that the certificate was signed with. So we have to configure our webhook with the CA bundle. And this is done in the webhook configuration YAML file. So if we briefly take a look at that webhook YAML file, I have a webhook template.yaml and this is my mutating webhook configuration. And here we configure our webhook. And the important part is under the client config is the CA bundle section. We have to put the CA base64 version in here. So to do that, I'm going to say open SSL base64 and I'm going to base64 that CA certificate that we generated. And I'm going to add it to an environment variable. So I go ahead and do that. And now I can use that environment variable. I can inject it into my file. So I'm just going to use said to replace the placeholder with the actual base 64 value and I'm going to replace those values in the webhook template YAML and generate a new webhook.yaml. So if I copy paste this to the terminal and we look on the left, we'll see a new file called webhook.yaml. And if we take a look at that, we can see that has our base 64 CA certificate in the CA bundle. So now the Kubernetes API will know how to validate the certificate since it has the CA bundle in the configuration. So now that we have our TLS certificate ready to go, we have a Kubernetes secret to deploy it. And we've also configured our webhook with the CA bundle. Let's take a look at what the webhook configuration looks like. The webhook configuration is a configuration that tells Kubernetes about our webhook. So we say API version is admission registration v1, kind is mutating webhook configuration, and we give our webhook a name. And I'm going to call it example webhook. Then we can have an array of webhooks here. And my one is going to be called 
called example webbook.default.service.cluster.local. It needs to be a DNS qualified name. And then I have admission review versions. So when we start writing the code, you'll see that we can only accept one type of object from the Kubernetes cluster. And it's going to make a request to our API and it's going to give us an admission review. So we can basically state here what type of reviews we accept and what we're compatible with. And then we can also set a timeout. So depending on how long we're planning to run our code, we can set an appropriate timeout. And the next bit is very important is a selector. So you can put any type of Kubernetes selector here to select an object that meets the criteria of our webhook. So you can put an object selector. So I've just used a simple label selector over here where I select any object that has the example webhook enabled label and it's set to true. You can also use a namespace selector which will select every object in a specific namespace. So this tells the Kubernetes API which objects to select which qualifies for the request to this webhook. So in my case it can be any object that has this label so it could be pods, secrets, config maps and anything else. The next bit is the client config. Since the Kubernetes cluster is going to be our client it's going to be making a call to us so it needs to know how to make a web request. So here we say what Kubernetes service it needs to call and the Kubernetes service is called example webhook and it's in the default namespace and then this is the path of the endpoint to call. So I'm going to create an endpoint called mutate and then it also has a CA certificate so it knows how to validate the TLS certificate. And the last bit is the rules that will trigger the request to this webhook. So we know that this webhook can be any type of object that has this label but I would like to restrict it to pods and I would also like to restrict it to only the create events. So the rules allow us to specify some operations and resources and also API groups and versions of those resources. So here I say I'm interested in operation create and the API groups for pods will be blank. The API versions is V1 and the resource is pods. So I only want to know about any pod that has this label on it and I want to know whenever it gets created. So you can see the flexibility here. We can basically allow Kubernetes to call our webhook for a number of different reasons. So that's how we define a webhook configuration. Now if I go and use kubectl and apply this YAML file, Kubernetes will start making requests to my webhook which doesn't exist yet. So now we need to go through the process of writing some code and creating a webhook. So now we need to write some code. So what I'm going to do in the Kubernetes admission controllers introduction folder, I'm going to create a new folder called source code. And this is where I'm going to write all my code. And before we start, we know the first thing that we need is a Docker file. So I'm going to create a new Docker file inside of the source code folder. And in this Docker file, I'm going to define my local development environment, which is going to be a Golang container. So I'm going to say from Go, and I'm going to use a lightweight Alpine image. I'm going to run Go 1.15 as dev environment. And I'm going to use a working directory called slash app. So I'm going to copy this from my readme and paste it in my Docker file. And this is my Golang dev environment. Now to build my dev environment, I'm going to say change directory to the source code folder. So I'm going to change directory to that. And then I'm going to say docker build dot minus T. I'm going to tag it as webhook. So I'm going to build a small Docker container called webhook, which is basically just running go in a container that we can use for development. Then next up, I'm going to say docker run minus IT. And I'm going to start up this application, I'm going to expose port 80 because we're just going to test on port 80 and run a webhook endpoint. And I'm going to mount my code. I'm going to mount the working directory into a folder called slash app. And that's going to be our working folder. And then I'm going to call my webhook container and I'm going to run sh as my entry point. So I go ahead and do this. And now I'm inside of the container. I can type go. We can see we have access to the go programming language and I can type ls minus l and we can see we have our docker file on the left hand side so we're doing all our code inside of a container so if you're new to go check out my link down below to my go introduction guide where we take a look at how to run go in a container how to write basic code i also take you through how to work with json and data and how to write a small microservice that exposes an http endpoint a lot of those fundamentals are what we're going to be using today to write our webhook for kubernetes so as per my readme we always start 
with Hello World. So I'm going to go and create a Go module. I'm going to say Go Mod in it, and I'm going to call it Example Webhook. So I go and do that. That'll create a Go Mod file on the left here, which is basically stating the name of our module and the Go programming language version. I'm then going to start with a Hello World application. So I'm going to create a new file called main.go in my source code directory, and then I'm going to proceed to copy this small snippet into the file. So in here, I define package main. I import two dependencies. One is for logging and one is for an HTTP web server. And then I define my main function where I handle two HTTP endpoints. One is the root of the page, which is just the root of the site. The other one is slash mutate, which will be the endpoint that Kubernetes will call. And then I just say HTTP listen and serve port 80. And then I also have two handle functions for each of those endpoints. I have handle root, which is for the root of the API. And then I have handle mutate, which is for the mutate endpoint. And in both of these, I'm just going to return like a hello world string. So I just say handle root and handle mutate. Now to build this code, all I need to do is run this bit of logic here. And I say go build, say dash o webhook. This will produce a small binary called webhook that we can run. I can then say dot slash webhook in order to invoke that binary. And we now have our webhook service up and running. If I open up the browser and I go to localhost, we can see we can hit the handled root endpoint. I can also say slash mutate and I can hit the mutate endpoint. So that's how we run a small web server in Go. Now, because our Go environment is inside of a container, our Kubernetes cluster is also inside of a container. It's going to be a little difficult to get the two to talk because in Windows Docker, container networking is not fully supported. So my Go dev environment, I've exposed port 80. I'm going to have to close that environment down and run it as net host in order to allow the container to talk to the kind cluster. This is something you may not have to do if you're running in Linux or if you're developing against a cloud based cluster. And now I'm going to rerun the container, but this time not expose port 80. And I'm going to try to connect my dev environment with my kind cluster by running network host. So I'm going to say docker run minus it net host. I'm going to mount in my cube config file so that my container can talk to my kind cluster. And I'm also going to mount in the source code as I did previously. So I go ahead and run this and this will give me a container where I can see my code, I can do my development and I can access the Kubernetes cluster. Now to test the Kubernetes cluster access, what I'm going to do is install curl and then I'm going to use curl to download the Kubernetes kubectl utility. So I'm going to download that utility and then I'm going to move that utility to use a local bin and give it execution permission. So now with that done, I can say kubectl get nodes and we're in our container. We can see we can make a successful request to the Kubernetes API. Now using code, how do we interact with Kubernetes? Kubernetes has a lot of libraries that we can use and we'll be using some of them today. Now, since we'll be creating a webhook, Kubernetes will send events to our web service and we'll need to translate these event requests into structs that we can understand. Now, Kubernetes has a library for serializing these requests to structs and it's called the runtime serializer. So what we're going to do is copy these two dependencies into our import statement over here. And then we need to define a universal deserializer. So we'll use the runtime package to define a new serializer and we'll define that as a global variable. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it just above my main function as a global variable. And we'll be using this universal serializer to transform these web requests into structs that we can understand. Now to authenticate with Kubernetes, there's going to be two ways to implement it. When we're running in a production environment, we're going to be using a Kubernetes service account token to authenticate with the API server. When we're developing locally, we can use a cube config. So I'm going to show you the code on how to authenticate both ways. So what we're going to do is create two new global variables. One is going to be our configuration to deal with the cube config. And the other one is going to be a client set, which allows us to access the Kubernetes client. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two environment variables in our main function. The first one is called use cube config. This is an environment variable we can turn on when developing locally to use a cube config file to talk to Kubernetes. In a production environment, this value will not exist, which means it'll use an RBAC token. The second environment variable is a cube config string, which is basically a path to a cube config file if you want to bring a different file. If we leave this out, we'll use the default location for the cube config, which is in the home directory. And next up, I'm going to be copying this if statement block, which is basically going to decide which authentication mechanism to use. So in my main function, just after defining the environment variables, I'm going to paste this block. 
And this if statement is very simple. So basically, if the use cube config flag is not defined, it will enter this part of the if statement, else it will use a cube config file. So if use cube config hasn't been defined, we'll use the rest.incluster config mechanism. So in the client Go library for Kubernetes, it defines a rest package, which basically allows us to deal with configuration. So I'm going to use this and I'm going to call the in cluster config function. So this will basically default to a service account if we're running this in a pod inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And then it will basically get a config value back and we'll assign it to our global variable called config. Now, if we've defined the use cube config environment variable, we'll go into this else block where we'll define a cube config string. Now, if the cube config environment variable is empty, we'll default to the home directory. So we'll simply use the home directory and then join that path with dot cube. So it'll be the home directory slash dot cube slash config, which is the default location for the cube config. Otherwise, we also allow the user to override it with an environment variable. The Kubernetes client Go library also provides us with a client CMD where we can build the config from flags. And in here, we're going to pass in the path to the cube config file, and it's going to return a cube config, which we're going to assign to our global variable called config. So this is a very easy mechanism to decide whether to authenticate with a service account or to use a cube config file when talking to Kubernetes. Now that we have a config defined, the next step is to define the client set using the config. So I'm going to paste this next block where I say kubernetes.new for config. I pass in my config and that returns a client set. I then check for any errors and then I assign the client set to my global variable called client set. I can then use this client set to talk to the Kubernetes API and return pods, config, secrets, and whatever I have permission to do. Then to make all of this code work, I'm going to have to import a few dependencies. So in my readme, I define all the dependencies I'm going to need. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this to my import block. So I'm using OS to access environment variables. I'm using FMT for just printing to the terminal for debugging. I'm using file path to basically construct the cube config file path. And then the important one is the client go package for Kubernetes. This library is a, the library that's going to allow us to do everything with Kubernetes. We also have the client go rest package, which we're using for managing our Kubernetes config. We have the client CMD, as well as the home directory package. Now, since we've referred to the Kubernetes client go package, we're going to need to run go get to download this package to our dev environment before compiling the code. So to add an entry to our go mod file, we're going to say go get and we're going to download client go and you can see I'm pinning a specific version that's compatible with my Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to copy this, paste it to the terminal and that's going to go ahead and download v0 21.0 of the client go package to my dev environment. Environment. You can find the client Go on GitHub, and it's important to check the compatibility matrix to make sure you're pulling the right version for your cluster. And when you're doing cluster upgrades, you may have to come and upgrade your client Go package to match the cluster version you're deploying to. You can see they have a nice table illustrating a compatibility matrix of which version of the client Go matches the version of Kubernetes. Then once I've pulled that package down, I'm going to build my application saying Go build, and that will also go ahead and download dependencies that have it hasn't pulled yet. And this will pull all the dependencies into my go mod file as well as my go.sum file. Now to run the code locally, I'm going to enable the environment variable to say use cube config so I can use my local cube config to talk to my kind cluster. So I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to run my application saying dot slash webhook and we can see it prints out which cube config it's going to use and then it pauses. So you can see our application doesn't do much other than authenticate with the cluster and pause. So let's create a test.go file and I'll show you how to retrieve all pods from a given namespace and we can just retrieve the pods from the cube system namespace. So to do this in my source code directory I'm going to create a new file called test.go and in here we say that this file is part of package main. We define an import statement and an empty function called test. So to access Kubernetes to list the pods it's very simple. We can go ahead and use the global client set that we've defined in our main.go and we can create a new variable called pods. We can use the global client set and we just say dot 
corev1.pods and we can define a namespace here. I'm just going to leave it empty to basically return all pods. And then we just call the list function. And here we can also define a list option. So we can actually filter all the pods in the cluster. But for now, I'm just going to return all pods. And then what I do, I just do some simple error checking. So I make sure that the error is not null. And then I'm going to run a simple print statement. So I'm just going to say there are X amount of pods in the cluster where X is going to be the length of pods.items. And the dependencies we're going to need for this code, I'm going to define in the import statement, we're going to need context. We're also going to need the meta v1 package from the Kubernetes API machinery package. And this is used to pass in list options for the pods we want to retrieve. And finally, I'm just going to pass in FMT, which is to print to the terminal. And then what I need to do is go to my main function. And after we've done the authentication bit here, I'm just going to invoke that test function. So I'm just going to invoke it like this. And then I'm going to go ahead and build my application and run it saying dot slash webhook. And we can see it prints there are nine pods in the cluster. And these pods are mainly from the cube system namespace because I don't have anything else deployed to this cluster. So now that we have a working app that can talk to Kubernetes and list pods, let's proceed to create our mutating webhook. So firstly, we're going to need to implement that webhook endpoint. And then let's see what object Kubernetes sends to that endpoint when an event occurs. Now, before we can enable a an webhook endpoint, we need to make sure we expose an endpoint with TLS enabled. So to do this, I'm going to add two more dependencies to my application. One is the flag package to allow the user to override the path of the SSL or TLS certificates. And the other one is just a string package. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to define another global variable called server parameters, where I can allow the system administrator to override the port, the certificate file and the key file. So that is a new struct that I define. And then I'm going to define a global variable called parameters. And then in my main function, I'm going to use the flag package to define a bunch of flags where I can read parameters of my application. So here I'm just going to paste a few lines. I'm going to say flag.intvar and I'm going to read the port from the command line. And I'm also going to read TLS cert file as well as TLS key file to allow the user to override the port as well as the locations to the TLS certificates. And you can see I put some default values in here as well. So we're going to listen on port 8443. We're going to grab our TLS certificate from this location and the private key from that location. And then I'm going to say flag.parse. And then what I'm going to do down here where we start our web server, instead of starting on port 80, I'm going to replace this line with this. I'm going to say HTTP.listen and serve TLS. That's the different one. And then I'm going to pass in the port, which is now configurable, as well as the parameter cert file and key file. So this will now ensure that our endpoint is listening over a TLS connection. So next up, let's go and implement this handle mutate function. So we can see what event Kubernetes passes to our web server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define another dependency called IOUtil at the top here. And this allows us to do IO activity and work with files. And in this handle mutate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this line and I'm going to paste this block over here. And what we do now is we're going to retrieve the body of the web request by using IOUtil.read all. And we're going to take the HTTP request by saying r.body. So we're going to read the request body and then we're just going to write it to a temp file using IOUtil.write file. So we can go and have a look and see what the API server passed to us. So now we have a web server with a mutate endpoint that can talk to the cluster. So let's go ahead and deploy this so we can see what Kubernetes will send to us when a new event occurs. So to, in order to deploy this, we might have to expand our Docker file a little bit more. So at the moment, we're only defining our dev environment. So let's put the go build statements in here and, and make a build layer so we can compile our application and then deploy it to the cluster. So what I'm going to do is extend this Docker file a little bit and I'm going to say from dev environment as build environment, I'm going to copy the go mod and some file and I'm going to say go mod download and then I'm going to copy the rest of the source code into the container into slash app and I'm going to run go build and produce this webhook binary that'll compile our code in a container and then next up we want to create another layer which is the runtime so I'm going to say from alpine 3.10 as runtime I'm going to copy from the build environment I'm going to copy the webhook binary out into user local bin I'm going to give it execution rights and I'm going to start it up in the entry point so to build that I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to change directory to the Kubernetes admission controller introduction source code folder. And I'm going to say docker build dot minus t example webhook v1. 
one that's going to go ahead and build up the container image that we can deploy to our cluster and then for my kubernetes cluster to be able to access the container image i'm just going to push it up to docker hub by saying docker push so that'll go ahead and push it up to docker hub and then we can go ahead and deploy it to our cluster so now that we have an image pushed the next thing we need to do is deploy our tls certificate so on the left here in the tls folder we have that example webhook tls certificate we generated earlier i'm going to go ahead and deploy that to the default namespace saying kubectl apply tls example webhook tls yaml going to go ahead and do that that'll create our secret in the default namespace and next up i'm going to apply the rbac file now let's take a look at the rbac file i have an rbac.yaml over here and this defines the service account we're going to be using to authenticate with the kubernetes api remember locally i use the cube config file in the cluster i'll be using a service account and the code will be compatible with both mechanisms as i showed earlier for the service account i'm going to create a cluster role that basically has get watch and list access to pods and then i have a cluster role binding which binds that cluster role with my service account so it's always important to give your web granular access that it needs and not too much access so i'm going to go ahead and apply that rbac file and then next up i'm going to apply the actual deployment of my pod so let's take a look at this so this is the deployment we firstly have a kubernetes service where we're exposing port 443 and port 80 and then we have a deployment spec so here i'm just going to call it example webhook we're going to run one replica i specify a service account name this is very important otherwise this pod will not be able to authenticate with kubernetes and do what it needs to do and then i define my simple container over here exposing port 8443 and port 80 for testing and my container image url and i mount in my secret here you can see i'm mounting my secret to etc webhook certs and that's the default location for the tls certificates so to deploy this it's very simple i just say kubectl apply i'm going to apply that yaml file so to test whether this is up and running i can say kubectl get pods we can see our webhook is creating and once it's up and running we can say kubectl logs and we can see it's now running and it's authenticating with the cluster so it's saying there are 11 pods in the cluster now we can go ahead and deploy our webhook by applying the webhook.yaml so i'm going to go ahead and run that and that'll create a new admission webhook and register it with the cluster so now every time an object with our specific label gets created and that object is of type pod and the operation is create we will get an event that will trigger and it will trigger a request to our api in order to trigger that request we're going to need to deploy a dummy application that needs a mutation So to deploy a demo app that needs mutation, I have a demo pod.yaml on the left-hand side here. And if we take a look at that, it's a simple pod. You could also use a deployment. And the pod here has a label called example webhook enabled true. And I'm just going to run a simple Nginx container here. When I apply this using kubectl, our webhook should get a request. So I say kubectl in the default namespace, apply demo pod.yaml. Now, when I run this, we'll notice that an error will occur. This is because the API server will try to make a call to our application and our application is not responding with the right response but this is because we haven't finished the admission controller yet so we're simply writing that request to file so that we can see what it looks like now this event that kubernetes will send to our api is called an admission review now to see what it looks like we can go ahead and copy that file out of our container and copy it to our local machine so to do that i say kubectl get pods i grab the pod name and then i say kubectl c the pod name and I copy that temp request file out of the pod and I'm just going to call it mock request.json which it's going to copy to locally so then I can have a look at it on the left hand side here and if we format this file we can see this is what an admission review looks like so we have the API version kind as admission review and here we can see everything about the event so the request kind is of type pod we can see the name of the pod the namespace it was created in the operation that triggered the event and we can see the entire object here so we can see the labels that it has we can even go down and see what container image was deployed we can see it's nginx and everything that would be in the yaml would appear in here so part of our handle mutate function we have to use the deserializer to transform this request json into a struct that we can use so to work with the admission review object i need to add 
add another dependency. I'm going to add the admission v1 beta one admission review package. And I'm also going to add errors. And in my handle mutate function, what I'm going to do is add an admission review object. So I'm going to create an empty object of type admission review. And then I'm going to use the universal deserializer we created earlier to convert the request body into this object. So you can see I use universal deserializer decode, I pass in the request body, and I also pass in a reference to our admission review struct. This will go ahead and deserialize that request and throw any errors if there's any problem with the request or if the request is null. Then for information purpose, what I'm going to do is print out some fields of that request object. So I'm just going to print to the screen admission review, the kind, the operation that triggered it and the request name. So name of the pod. Now to do a simple mutation, we're going to have to grab the pod object out of the admission review. And then we can use that to change that object and submit it back as an admission response. So to work with pods, I'm going to add the API v1, the core v1 package as a dependency, so I'm going to go ahead and paste this one in our import section. And then back at my handle mutate function, what I'm going to do is define an empty pod. So I define it like this saying var pod api v1 dot pod. And then what I'm going to do is use the JSON package, the unmarshal function to convert the object that we receive into a pod object. So what I'm going to do here is basically just deserialize that request, pass in a reference to our empty pod, and this will populate our empty pod variable with the object that we receive from the admission review request. And then I'm also going to handle any errors that might come back from that statement. And this will give us a pod that we can mutate. So now that we have a pod, that we can mutate in order to change anything on that pod, we have to define patches. So what I'm going to do is define a new struct that's reusable that I can use for patching. And I'm going to call it patch operation. And what I'm going to do is add three fields to it. One is the operation, which is whether to add or delete, then the path, which is the JSON path to that object. So I can define a path to any part of the pod spec that I want to mutate. So I can add node selectors, I can add labels, annotations, and and so forth. And then the actual value, which is just an interface. And then back down at my handle mutate function, I'm just going to define a new slice called patches, which is a slice of patch operation. So I can add as many patches as I like. Now, depending what you're writing an admission controller for, if you want to mutate a pod, a secret, a config map, a deployment, a daemon set, you have to make sure you read the Go documentation for that object. So because I'm mutating a pod, I go to the Go document documentation for pods. So I can see all the fields that exist. And I can see here is the pod spec. If I click into that, I can see all of the things that are part of the pod spec. So node selector, the node name, everything that you would normally see in the pod YAML. There's also object meta, which is things like the name of the pod, the namespace it belongs to, and other things such as labels and annotations. So it's very important to consult the Go documentation when working with Kubernetes. So to keep this mutation and demo simple, what I'm going to do as part of the mutation is inject a label onto the pod. So to do this, I'm going to have to grab all the existing labels and then generate a new label appended to the existing set of labels and apply it back to the pod. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull out the existing labels from the pod. So pod.object meta we saw earlier dot labels and this labels is just a map of strings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to append a new label called example webhook and the value is it worked. So that's going to be my new set of labels. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new patch operation. So I'm going to append it to my patches slice I have up here. I'm going to say append and I'm going to create a new patch operation. The operation is add and the path is metadata slash labels and the value is labels. So remember, I can add as many patches as I want and I can override every aspect of the pod. Now, once I've completed all my patching, the important part is I have to convert the patches slice to a byte array. So I'm going to say json.marshall and I'm going to convert it to a slice of bytes called patch bytes. And I'm also going to handle any errors. So if there's any errors that come back from that, I'll print that out. And then I'm going to craft an admission response. And this is the only valid response that the API server will accept. Remember when I created the demo pod earlier, we saw that error message. That is because we weren't handling that mutation. So to handle it properly, we need to create an admission review response. 
And this is how we do it. I just create this new object called admission review response, which is an admission review object with a response section. And what I'm doing here is I'm just crafting a blank response, passing the same UID of the request. And I'm saying allowed is true. This allows me to accept or reject the mutation. Then the next line here, I'm going to take that re review response dot response dot patch. And I'm going to assign the patch byte slice that I've created at the top here to this patch field. Now that we have the admission review response, we can go ahead and convert that response to bytes and send it back as a response. So to do that, it's very simple. I just create a new object called bytes. I use the json.marshall package and I convert this admission review response object to bytes. I then handle any error that may occur and I write it back to the response. And to make sure it all works, I can hop back into my Go development container. I can say go build and it's all good to go. Then to build a new version, of the Docker image, I'm just going to change directory back into the source code folder. I'm going to say Docker build and build up a new container image. And then finally, once that's built, I'm going to go ahead and run Docker push to push that image up to Docker Hub. And to have Kubernetes pull a new image down, I'm just going to delete my webhook pod. Now we can redeploy our application that needs a demo mutation. So this will be this demo pod on the left, our Nginx pod. So to deploy that, I say kubectl apply in the default namespace demo pod.yaml. So I go ahead and run that and now we can see the demo pod has been created. And if we take a look, we can see our mutation has worked. If I say kubectl get pods dash dash show dash labels, we can see the demo pod is creating. And if we take a look at the labels, we can see it has our new mutated label called example webhook with the value it worked. So hopefully this video helps set the foundation of understanding Kubernetes admission controllers and how to write your own first mutating webhook. If you're new to Go, be sure to check out the link to the playlist down below to my introduction to Go series, where we will learn how to install Go inside of a container, how to run Go locally as a dev environment using Docker, and then all the fundamentals of Go, including writing your first microservice and a command line application. If you like the video, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell. And if you want to support the channel even further, be sure to hit the join button below and become a member and also check out the community page. And as always, thanks for watching and until next time, peace.